Hi, um, my name's Eileen Cronin. I am uh, a I was a mentor and a mentee in the writer to writer program with AWP um, many times. Um, and today I'm going to talk with two great writers um, whose voices really need to be heard um, in uh, greater capacity um, over the coming years. And it was my great pleasure to get to know each of these people. Um, I started out in the program as a mentor in the fall of 2015 with TK Dalton, who is below me. And then I was a mentee um, with James Tate Hill, who is not here. Um, we wanted to just have a conversation about our relationships as mentor and mentor mentee. But I did do the men. Uh, I was a mentee in fiction. Um, I believe it was in about 2018. And then um, Rachel, Souza and I were paired up and she was my mentee in fall of 2020. Both TK and I and Rachel and I have worked on me memoir during that time. Although TK can tell you that he actually studied fiction while he was in his MFA program. Um, and Rachel can tell you that she's writing fiction sometimes too. So, uh, and I am writing fiction, which is what I worked on with J James Tate Hill. So uh, having said all of that, uh, I would like to start by just asking you each to introduce yourselves, um, starting with uh, chronology. We'll start with TK and talk about why you chose to get into the mentorship when you got into the mentorship. Okay, so thanks for having me, uh, Eileen, and thanks to AWP for organizing this. Um, I, like Eileen said, I studied uh, fiction. I got an MFA in fiction at the University of Oregon, uh, and that was a good experience. And I learned an awful lot. Um, that, I, that, that finished in 2007, and I, um, I moved to New York City, where I live now. Um, I was teaching a bunch, um, and then I picked up some work as a sign language interpreter. Um, I'm from a deaf-parented family, and so I signed some at home growing up. Um, and I was juggling uh, sort of interpreting and teaching uh, while trying to sort of like shift a little bit and play around with something I swore I would never do, which is write, write creative nonfiction. Um, so I was doing that, I had a little baby and we were about to have a second baby. Um, and at that point I was like, I could use some help. Um, and so I learned about this program and um, I was also writing uh, from a position of a, a disabled position, right? So like I'm a writer with, dis with a disability um, and I think a lot about how that, that, that perspective shapes the way I, I compose. And in nonfiction, it's sort of unavoidable, right? You've got this eye uh, everywhere um, and you can't, it is, it's much harder to shift to, to sort of, uh, you have to negotiate disability in a certain way. Um, and I didn't know how to do that. So those sorts of conversations were where Eileen and I started and it was really useful. I'd never really had a chance to talk out um, how disability shapes the actual words on the page. Um, and so that was, that was what was really useful for it, um, at that, at that sort of key transitional point. Yes. Thank you. Um, I do want to clarify some, something, a couple of things. Uh, you said, uh, you're, you come from a deaf hearing, use that term again. You, you, you sometimes speak fast. <laughs> it's, it's, tell it's, tell it's us. A, the regional no, temporary you know, you know, flesh that out for us a little bit because that's okay. a very not everyday experience. Absolutely. Um, so briefly, um, my mom is hearing. My dad is late deaf, and uh, he went deaf in his thirties. So we signed. We learned sign going home at home, 
uh, growing up, it was not American Sign Language um, as practiced in, you know, uh, families with two deaf parents, right? As practiced in the deaf community, it was a sign supported English system. Um, idiosyncratic in a lot of ways, um, but it was what we used a lot um, because it's more effective than just repeating yourself a whole bunch mm -hmm. um, or than not understanding what's being, what's happening. Um, and so that shaped a lot of how I, it shaped my experience of language a lot and um, my, my sense of how communication works um, in ways that like I was starting to unpack as I was working with deaf people, right? Like mm -hmm. as an interpreter, I later studied language in a much more formal way and I later studied interpreting in a much more formal way um but one you know what some of the questions that emerge as I was doing that work was like well what what was my own experience and position in relationship to to that language um and to sort of language that narrates or or has to navigate disability in a significant way mm -hmm. um so I I said deaf parented family um Oh, it's sort of okay. half deaf parented almost. Right. But, but a family mm -hmm. where, you know, I sometimes will refer to my family as a special needs family. Right. I, my brother's autistic. Right. I'm disabled. I have a brain injury and my dad's late deaf. And so the, the three, mm -hmm. the three men, right. Have disability narratives of a certain, a certain stripe, right. That, okay. that shape our family system. So anyway, um, it, it sort of tugged me towards memoir and I didn't know quite how to handle it. And so entering, uh, entering into a one-on-one a, a -on -one conversation with someone else whose memoir also navigated that kind of that kind of arc was something I was I was I was excited about doing. Okay, very cool. Um, thank you. And Rachel, Rachel came in in the fall of 2020, and she was working on memoir and recently graduated from Salve Regina's. Um, MFA program. Tell us more about you and what what was your aim back then? Yeah. So, well, first of all, thank you for having me and for letting me participate in this discussion. Um, so I, after graduating from undergrad, I started within the academic publisher um, world. So um, I work in editorial at an academic publisher. Um, and a few years ago, my one of my old professors came to me to tell me that Salve Regina, my alma mater, was starting an MFA program. Um, and it was going to be helmed under Anne Hood, um, who I'm sure you you probably know. Um, so she convinced me to join that MFA program. Um, and it was such a, a good experience for me. It was a low residency program. So I continued to work full time. And I finally started writing my memoir. Um, like TK, I come from a family of people with disabilities. Um, instead of the three men, it's the three women in my family. Um, my sister, mom, and I all share a physical disability known as Charcot Marie Tooth Disorder. Um, so I started writing that throughout the MFA program. Um, I graduated in spring of 2020. So before I started the Writer to Writer mentorship, um, after graduating, which I did during the pandemic, um, which was really unfortunate because it was completely virtual, um, I definitely felt like I lost some of that uh, connection by having it virtually. Um, so after that, I knew I wanted to continue that similar type of structure where with the low residency program, I was submitting work um, to a professor who was also a published writer and they would give me feedback. It was very similar to the writer to writer program. Um, so I signed up for that and I really was happy that I got to work with Eileen, someone who also has a disability um, because previously I hadn't worked with anyone that shared that type of experience. So it was interesting to get both experiences, both people without disabilities and then someone with one. Um, mm -hmm. Because my writing, and I'm sure all of our writing, we aim to focus on a larger audience, not just mm -hmm. people with disabilities. But at the mm -hmm. same time, it's nice to have that feedback from someone who has similar experiences and can understand on a deeper level. So that's why I did Writer to Writer. And I'm so glad I got to work with Eileen through that. Yeah, you raised some really interesting points because... Um, you know, 
I have worked with a lot of non-disabled people, uh, although who knows, right? Sometimes people have disabilities and they don't like know it or they don't like under like identify. So, um, but I have worked with a lot over the years. And of course, um, nobody identified with a disability uh, when, when I was starting out. Um, so having said all of that, I, I kind of feel like sometimes when people who don't have disabilities are helping, you know, with editorial decision making, they don't understand how the impact of what some things mean to a to an audience because we have all the experience in our heads of how the able-bodied world hears certain things and um people without disabilities don't necessarily know those things they wouldn't think of it or they might have preconceived ideas about it that we know differently about. So um, there's that. And then there's also um, basically comfort zone and all of that kind of thing sometimes comes down to having someone with a disability can make it a little bit uh, easier to talk about it and not feel judged, I, I would think. Um, it's sometimes hard to talk about some of the emotional um, component or the so really more the social component um, with people uh, who aren't disabled when you're writing because you need to tease it out a bit. And I don't think that people don't have an experience really, sometimes they have great questions but a lot of times I don't know if they um, understand the same things that we're trying to say and how how we're trying to say it, if that makes sense. Um, I'll try to give some examples. Uh, dealing with difficult situations, like embarrassing or humiliating situations, right? Uh, that you're trying to write about that can come up often in writing about disability. Um, sometimes I think um, the tendency for writers is to, well, maybe you shouldn't go there. That's too much. It's going to sound sad. And um I think we know and we have learned as writers with disabilities, uh, that's why I have to go there. <laughs> and um, so I think, and I think it'll be okay. I think people can take this. Um, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? I can, I can tackle part of that, I think. Um, one, I took a bunch of notes when you were talking just now, and I think the thing that jumps out at me as a starting point is this idea of shared experience, right? Um, disability takes so many different forms. Um, mm -hmm. Visibility and invisibility can mm -hmm. shape what that experience is like uh, when the like pressure points and flashpoints show up, right? But they always do kind of show up. And I think like some of the things that make it complicated to tell stories about disability or, or from a disabled standpoint or informed by the like the special knowledge not special knowledge but like the um there's a scholar who calls it complex embodiment right the way in which like your embodied experience shapes the way you see the world and like the way you navigate the world and how that is valuable a resource right okay so i think about the shared experiences of encountering stigma and the shared experiences of disclosure um and those are things that depending on visibility and other factors right um, they happen at different points in time, but they're part of most of the story arcs of people who, you know, navigate the world with disability as part of their identity, right? Um, the other thing that I think comes up that I think about in terms of mentorship is this idea of, of sort of lineage or generations, right? Like um, one of the things that's complicated that I think a lot about with my own disabled embodiment is like, I'm, I'm sort of like an in-between age. <laughs> Uh, like I started in 
I sort of remember when the ADA was passed. I was a kid. I was, I'll, I don't know if I was nine or 10 when it was passed it was July. I'd have to do the math, which I'm not really good at doing on the spot. But I was, I was a kid. My dad was a full-fledged grown up. Those experiences shaped us in certain ways because he grew up without the ADA. I grew up with it sort of, um, but I was sort of sick, but not disabled when it passed. Later, as I became unsick, I became disabled, right? But it was in the ADA era. Younger writers grew up with the ADA um, with a sense of evolving and emerging disability pride, right? Um, which faces tons of headwinds still from stigma and disclosure, but it's more exist it's more it exists in a different way than it did, I think, 30 years ago or 50 years ago. So the idea of different generations going through different things, it's really interesting, it's really valuable, but it in the context of mentorship, it becomes really important that folks are talking across generations, right? And understanding what what previous generations of disabled people went through, um, how stigma and disclosure and other shared experiences shape that, um, and how it's different, right? And how we can sort of avoid erasing that, honor it, celebrate it, and sort of, I don't know, just think just think about it um, as part of our own, you know, inheritance, I guess. You know, that's a really interesting point. I think when we talked at the, um, the conference in uh, 2021, was it last a year ago in March? That came up and, you know, it was something that I had only begun to think about on my own. I started to realize that I have some real hangups that I don't think other people have. <laughs> Like I'm starting to realize I need to um, to notice this. And I think that that came from a lot of like intense discrimination that that existed in the 60s. Um, you know, it was not long before the six. Well, there were still a lot of people getting thrown into institutions like me and. Um, not coming out. Um, so there was a real kind of sense of criminalization of disability, which still exists. I totally see that in the homeless population or the population of people who are unhoused in Los Angeles for sure. Um, but um, so in my day, it wasn't, it was presumed as a young person in the 60s that you were, um, you were, you had uh, intellectual disabilities if you had a physical disability. It was all just kind of the same thing. You just belonged somewhere else locked up. So it was really, um, it was really very different than today. And I realized that I, um, you know, I grew up with that, with that experience and also nowhere to express it because you weren't allowed to talk about it. And then came to this point in time and younger people may have been talking about it, but I feel like nobody's talking about this really. And in contrast, to all the things that have gone on in our history, in American history. I think that these things um, have left a lot of wounds and wounded families, whole families. Um, you go both brought up that you have multiple disabilities. I should say that I um, have, I was always believed to be the person with a disability in my family. I'm one of 11 children. And I was born with my legs missing from about the knees from a, a pill called thalidomide, which never should have existed, um, or at least should never have been given to pregnant women, um, and is very much behind the, the reason for all the laws that we have for um, uh, how we conduct clinical trials. Um, and not prescribing to pre pregnant women um, marketing drugs, uh, although I think there seems to be a, a, a whole shift away from that, that used to be a lot stricter, but anyway, um, 
aside from that, there are people in my family with mental illness. So um, that never has been included typically in the past as a disability. And it's, it's actually one that I'm more and more concerned about um, in the United States. So anyway, um, uh, Rachel, what are you um, doing in ac academic publishing now? And what are your goals for yourself as a writer? Uh, so right now I'm working as a content strategist, um, which is the editorial department within academic publishing. Um, I publish textbooks like nutrition textbooks, respiratory care, and dental. Um, so it's very different than what I'm doing creatively. Um, creatively, so I'm working on my memoir, as you know, and I am um, in the process of revising it heavily. Um, and then I want to start querying agents to try to get that out there. Um, as I did mention, I am also working very early stages of a novel. Um, because like we said, I have... My sister and my mother both share my disability. And within my memoir, I'm barely writing about them at, at all. I'm writing about them in context to how they relate to me, but not about their stories because that's their prerogative. That's for them to tell. But at the same time, I like the idea of having these three women in a family with a disability, with an uncommon disability and the different generations. Um, my mom grew up before the ADA passed um, and she had surgery and wasn't able to go to school because it wasn't a a, there wasn't accommodations for her. Fast forward years later, when my sister had a similar surgery, she was able to go to school because they were able to make those concessions. Um, so what I wanna do with, with a fiction, with a novel is write this dynamic very similar to what my family's gone through, but fictionalize it so that way I have more room to, to put myself in my mom and my sister's position without speaking through their mouths. So it's kind of what I'm doing with writing. Um, my memoir is definitely my prime focus. Um, and like I said, that's mostly about me and about traveling while disabled and growing up while disabled. Um, and do you want to tell us a little bit about that disability? Because I, Charco Marie is not something a lot of people have ever heard of. And, you know, I was so intrigued by reading your memoir because some of it reminded me a lot of myself. But then it was like, no, this is a whole new level of gaslighting on the brain mm. um, that some disabilities can do to us. In other words that business about passing and, um, you know, um, it's just easier. It's just easier when we appear to be able mm -hmm. um, and people don't like it if we announce that we aren't because they say, oh, is that how you see yourself? You shouldn't see yourself as disabled. That's... Mm -hmm. That get out of that. And they don't really understand. No, it's, it's who I am. And uh, it's quite hard to like pretend the other way. And who is this really for sometimes? It's not being able to identify it. But then on the other hand, there's just the general public, right? And you had, you had some interesting stories, for example, in college and on a bus in London and tell us about a little bit about those. Those are great stories. Yeah. So with my disability, um, it affects the nerves in my lower extremities. So my hands and my lower legs, um, I wear leg braces to help me walk. Um, so it's, it can be easy to hide my disability mm -hmm. technically. Um, if I'm wearing pants, you can't see the braces. Um, I do walk, um, with, with a, a different gait, but you, you don't know unless you know. Um, when I was younger, I 
didn't try to hide my disability quite as much. Um, but I did find in certain times when people realized I had a disability, they would assume I also had a, a mental disability as well, that it affected me somehow mentally. Um, I remember in elementary school, I needed to go to a, a special education, a physical education class with other people with disabilities. And I was the only one who wasn't affected mentally. And it, I, I just felt so out of place. And it was a stigma that as I grew up, I was so afraid people would assume that I wasn't as intelligent as I am or that there was more than just my, my physical disability wrong with me. Um, so I tried to hide that for a long time. Um, as I got older, what my memoir about Italy, um, that was one of the first times I was 18 and I started wearing shorts to show my braces while in Italy. Um, and that was one of the first times I was like, this is me and you can see me in, in all my disabled glory. Um, but there are still instances where if I take advantage of something that is for someone with a disability, people will give me backlash because they don't think I am disabled by looking at me. Um, that example you said while I was abroad, I was actually in Dublin um, with some friends and we were on a bus, a double-decker bus. Oh, oh, Dublin. Yeah. Yeah. And my three friends went upstairs to the top of the bus. Um, I didn't because I was afraid if the bus started moving and I was on the stairs, I might fall. Mm -hmm. So I, I took a handicap spot that was open because I am handicapped and it wasn't taken. Um, and this woman and her adult daughter came on the bus and they started making comments about me taking that seat. So... And this is just one instance. I mean, my sister has a handicap sticker on her car and we've parked in handicap spots and people have run over and told us we can't park there. It's for people with disabilities, um, even though we do have a disability. So, yeah, so I feel like I have an interesting disability because, like I said, I can hide it, but it's also still so prevalent in my day to day. That's why I feel like I need to write about it. Um, because so people understand that everyone is more than what you see on the surface. You know, there's, so, we all have our own struggles, which we know, but writing about my disability, I want other people who have a disability that might not be seen up front to know that they're, they're not alone. So. Yeah. 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 And also you have, um, I don't know, you just have a great insight into humanity that's even more important to me that it's 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 across all all life experiences something really important to read and tk i would like to talk a little bit about your writing and your experiences now i know you're getting a phd and i would love to hear uh, you talk all about that when you first came to me you we're just finished with your mfa from uh oregon Right. So I was I was seven years out from getting an MFA. Um, I don't need to talk uh, an awful lot about getting a PhD, um, but I do think there are some, you know, a bunch of what I'm doing is just about the teaching of writing, um, because sometimes in some parts of the country people are like, "Oh, you need a PhD to teach writing," and I'm like, "Yeah, you really don't. You really don't." But <laughs> if you think I do, then I do. So. Um, <laughs> Plus it's been nice to have health insurance during the pandemic. And I've found, I have found, you know, people who are interesting to talk to about things um, there. <laughs> um, so before I get myself into trouble, uh, I think like one of the things that I think is really interesting that comes out of more academic writing about disability um, is, or more academic writing in general, I'll say, um, is this idea of counter story. Um, so that's one of the more interesting things I've come across in, um, in the reading and writing I've been I've been doing on the academic side for the last couple of years, um, interestingly, a lot of what I encounter in like formal academic disability studies, disability literature and disability activism is already kind of talking about and doing, um, and a lot of high-powered academic disability scholars are drawing on stuff that is like digital-born, like from the community, from you know writers and thinkers, you know, you know, Mia Mingus on on outward, right. Um, 
and you know, people we published in the Deaf Poet Society in 2015 are now getting cited in, you know, the journal signs in 2021 or whatever. And I say, welcome to the party, you know, in a certain way. Um, but we've been doing this work for a, for a little a little bit, right? And thanks for noticing. Um, I think this, I, you know, we've been working in all our disabled glory um, for mm-hmm. kind of a while now, as Rachel put it, right? All right. <clears throat> um, so I think like uh, one of the things one of the things I've come across is this idea of counter story, which is a way of uh, a way of sort of like narrating um, narrating anything right, in a way that illustrates systems of oppression, systems of injustice, right? Um, so Asia Martinez is sort of has the book called, literally called Counter Story, um, where she sort of puts up, it's, she lays out the theory and then over the course of a bunch of chapters, she's like, example one, example two, example three. It's very um, practical and I like, I'm a writer, I like practical, um, but I think about Counter Story <clears throat> when it comes to disability because I think um, there's a way in which disability, chronic illness, acute illness, any kind of divergent bodily experience can shed light on the the things that are unjust in our country, right? Like I think about healthcare disparities and I think about my own whiteness, right? And my own whiteness being connected to my own parents' whiteness. And they had sort of like pretty good jobs, you know, like my mom was a school teacher. My dad was a carpenter who became sort of an engineer. And because they had good jobs, they had health insurance because we lived, you know, you know, first in Vermont and then outside Boston, they had access to healthcare, right? And whiteness made that all stable, right? And in some ways possible, right? And if I, and if I had, you know, any number of things could have changed, like I could have been born five years earlier and I'd probably be dead, right? <clears throat> like that's a, that's a possible outcome, right? Um, or I could not be white, right? And so a like, counter story is a, you know, you wouldn't narrate it like that exact way, but I think thinking through um, the way disability in- interacts with, right? And amplifies or, or just like, you know, exists in ways that are woven together with other systems of oppression that um, mm-hmm. we have a kind of obligation as writers to be like noticing and describing and putting into motion, um, you know, I think that's 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 something that comes out of some of the academic reading and writing I've been doing. Mm-hmm. Um, Rachel said, "You don't know unless you know," right? <laughs> I think there's a way in which, like, um, there's things that we know that we can we can deploy for that that kind of purpose as well. This sort of counter storying kind of purpose. Um, mm-hmm. But I like I like plots. I miss plots. I've been writing something with a plot uh, over the last like month or two, and uh, I would love to get back to writing plots, um, things mm-hmm. with plots, things with characters. Um, so I'm doing that this summer. And that is something you're really good at. Your characterizations are just phenomenal. Your dialogue is really good. I was really impressed by that. So I want to see you get back to plots and characters. Um, although what you bring up when you talk about um, different aspects of disability, like you take, you know, I I studied disability back in the 80s in Boston. It was a really great time for getting into it, you know, um, and a great place for it. Find Boston to be ahead of everybody on this. Um, And as a matter of fact, I'm in Martha's Vineyard now. And I noticed I went to the museum the other day. um, And um, they include disability and, you know, the museums are getting much, much better at inclusion, both in staffing and in, um, you know, the narratives in terms of all kinds of uh, isms, but many aren't so much on disability, but this, this, uh, this was an even handed, um, approach to the, you know, populations who have been oppressed. So they even include store, you know, parts of disability history here on, on Martha's Vineyard, which is pretty awesome. Um, like, for example, I didn't know there was a camp for people with dis- kids with disabilities, or maybe it was for people with disabilities. Um, I would love to go to it. I think it's called Camp Jabberwocky. I don't know if it still exists, but wow, that would have been great. Um, So 
Anyway, um, having said all of that, I just wanted to say how great it's been to talk to you. I, I think we're pretty much out of time. Is there anything else either of you want to bring up or talk about before we go? Anything about the mentorship? Anything you want to say about your next steps? Um, I can go first. I just, for my next steps, like I said, I'm still finishing up my memoir and hoping to query some agents within the coming months. Um, and I did just want to say again, thank you, Eileen, for thinking of me for this conversation and for doing the mentorship. Um, I did find your insight very valuable. Um, like I said, you were the first person with a disability that I worked with when it came to my writing. Um, so I found your perspective was very helpful. Um, so yeah, so thank you. Well, thank you. It was a delight to work with you. Um, and Tim, anything you want to say before we wrap up? Yeah, um, I think just to speak to something that specifically came out of our work together, um, I I thought about uh, a conversation we had, you know, was, is it really seven, six or seven years ago now? Um, seven years ago, right? Um, you and I had a conversation about like chronology um, and it was kind of like, I disagreed with the importance of chronology. You were like, just put it in the order in which it happened. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, do I have to? Um, but it got, it's gotten me thinking a lot about, um, you know, I, I frame it in my head as chronology versus neurology sometimes, right? Um, because I, my, my composition process, sometimes the way my sentences come out at first, sometimes the way they stay, the, <laughs> the whole, the, right up till they're out in the world is super, um, you know, they're super, they're, they're like not neurotypical sentences. Um, okay, so like I, I, it took me a little, a minute to sort of embrace that. MFA life as, as great as it was, like was not, they did not love neurodivergent sentence sentences or sentence structure, which like, mm -hmm. you know, God bless MFA people, but you know, like, so <laughs> there, there's just ways in which, you know, no one would sit down and be like, let's describe this language. Oh, it's obviously a neurodivergent language. It's like, no, no one it would, just sort of wouldn't occur to a group of 12 people around a table because it's outside that norm of that group. Okay, so this idea of chronology versus neurology, it, it started with our conversations together. Um, and I've just thought about it so much over time because um, at first I was like, I think it was wrong chronology doesn't matter, like time doesn't exist. And in 2022, of course, we all kind of are sympathetic to the idea that time is a complete capitalist fiction, but time is actually real. Events do happen in a certain order, right? And sometimes there's a logic hidden within that order um, or hidden within our reactions to you know, the event that, that preceded the event that's happening. All right, so what I would say is like over the last seven years, I've done so much thinking about chronology versus neurology and getting those things in balance um, is, is like, it's mm. like the key to almost anything I, I write that's worth reading, which is a minority of the work I produce. But like when it's when that balance between chronology and neurology is is right, the the voice I've produced is like it is my voice. Um, and the, the 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 way that the way the thing is structured, like mm -hmm. it is the way I want it to to look because it's the way it like lands, right? Mm -hmm. Based on how how stuff comes into my perception, how stuff comes out. It's true in fiction, it's true in nonfiction. And so that's just that, that like, that question, right? You know, chronology versus neurology, um, the, the way things happen and the way they feel. Um, that was a conversation, you know, that's continued in my head, but it started between us. And I'm just really grateful that it started between us. So thanks for that. Yeah, um, and I am so grateful for all that you, you gave me a ton of insight into, you know, I know a lot about uh, different political movements in the disability world, but I didn't know anything about disabled. I had no idea there's this like huge group of people who identify with disabilities within AWP or how to find them. Um, and you introduced me to the Facebook page and those people and we went to meetings at the conferences and that like totally changed my view of, of, you know, the isolation that I felt. Um, 
Uh, I also really appreciate how you always address, you know, you will address the um, intersectional issues, the, the um, you know, that it is easier to be white and disabled in many ways. I think it's important to say this about women, though, too. Maybe it's my age, but I'm getting up there and I know so many women who are face, who are um, looking at poverty at this at this point in their life um, of any race really that are single and struggling and still working in their sixties and barely making a living and they're now getting disabled they're now getting disabilities so I think it these things are really important. Um, parts of our society that have just been left out and the people going through these things do it um, in silence and in closets really without um, the world really knowing what they're going through. For example, pre-existing conditions. That was my struggle um, for years uh, with artificial legs before uh, Obama was uh, before Obama got the ACA passed. But I, I love to talk the political stuff with you, but also the the writing. You're you're both exceptional writers. You guys are amazing, and um, I want to see you both flourish. The world needs to have. Um, I think there could be a whole conversation and trend in our language to say, "Hey, that's." That's neurodivergent talk. <laughs> is there actually, is there actually like, is that only known in certain circles or could that be more of a mainstream conversation? Because there are so many people who are neurodivergent. These things are, are important. They have a lot. It's a whole language. Yeah, I think it's becoming more of a mainstream conversation and we should we should keep it going, you know. Right, right. And and as for chronology, by the way, I think um that it is important sometimes in um in the memoir process, it's hard because we do have to move back and forth in time to tell a story, but it's sometimes easier to just lay it out chronologically. And then in a later draft, you can figure out where to go up and down. Um, because I do think you do have to jump around. I, I, it's the hardest thing to explain. I've been teaching myself at UCLA Extension, and we just had a whole discussion about this last night. But um, yeah, and especially for people who have like pre and post disability stories, then chronology is even more um, important. But um, having mention chronology it is that time so let's wrap it up and thank you both for coming it's it's just great talking to both of you and i wish you both the best of luck in your writing and hope you stay in touch forever because i always love catching up all right well thanks eileen and thanks rachel this was a lot of fun yeah thank you both yeah. And thank you, AWP.